Hello. Uh, let, let me first uh, thank the organizers. It's a, a great pleasure and a great honor for me to give this lecture and participate in uh, celebrating Jean. Uh, I think actually that except for his thesis advisor, Freddy Delbin, I actually am the person probably in this room that I've known him for the longest time. <laughs> and uh, I met him, I checked from, a, from the dates of a seminar in Ecole Polytechnique in 1975 uh, I was still a graduate student uh, at the time, and he came from, from Belgium. Suddenly, he came, he came, he just appeared out of nowhere. I think that he was like 21 or 22, and uh, we had invited a speaker, uh, Charles Stiegel, who was a specialist of the Radon Nicodeme property, extremely, uh, had done extremely good work on the Radon Nicodeme property. And I was sort of, you know, hosting the, the visitor, the speaker and <coughs> at the seminar. I'm, I'm sorry, as you see, my voice is, something is wrong. And uh, so I was ho hosting the visitor. Suddenly I see this young man that comes. He really looked like a kid to me. I wasn't very old myself, but I mean, there's like three, four years between us. And uh, I remember he, he looked like a kid, although he had an attaché case and he looked very serious. He looked very uh, strict compared to us who were like wearing jeans and so on. And uh, he immediately said uh, uh, that he wanted to speak to, to Charles Stiegel, the, the speaker at the seminar, probably had no interest in us. And, uh, and Stiegel said, oh, okay, why not, and so on. And then. So all of a sudden they went into his office and stayed in his office for, for like one or two hours nonstop. I was very worried because I was supposed to, you know, felt responsible for my visitor, what was going to happen to him. And after a couple of hours, Stiegel came out. He was kind of pale and he looked tired, you know, and I, I thought, but you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have rescued you. You know, he probably bombarded you with questions and so on. I said, no, 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 he bombarded me with answers. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he said, that's the first person from whom I heard. He said, I've met someone completely exceptional. I'm sure I've, I've met someone exceptional. But it was really uh, an experience and I was, I said, oh, really? I mean, I was, you know, I was shocked myself, and of course later I found out <laughs> that he was uh, terribly right. <laughs> so uh, fortunately for me, uh, Jean was interested in the Radon Nicodeme property, as you can guess from this story, and so he worked for quite a while in initially, uh, and, and in his thesis, on the Radon Nicodeme property uh, for Banach spaces, and that meant that uh, I could work on Sidon sets without uh, any problem for quite a while. And I got a few good theorems while he was sort of cleaning up uh, the Radon-Nicodim property and solving any open problem that was around on the Radon-Nicodim property. <laughs> but after, in the 80s, he got interested in Sidon sets. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I very quickly gave up and you know, moved to, to something else. As you see, he wrote 11 papers on Sidon sets and, and proved a few things that I, I really thought I should have proved. But anyway, that's life. <laughs> so uh, Sidon sets are very easy to, to describe. They, 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 you, know, you see the definitions there, you can read them. It's a, it's a strange subject. It's a subject that was, you know, you, 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 you're, you're too young to know most of you, so it was fashionable. It was fashionable once <laughs> in the late 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, people like, Varro, very good mathematicians like Varopoulos, uh, uh, some Kerner in Cambridge, uh, Sam Drury were, you know, active in this field. So it was a very active field with lots of good people doing it. And then uh, it, it gradually sort of died. It, so, so it went into non-commutative. There was some hope of a revival for, and, and then it kind of became dormant after Jean, you know, did all the things that uh, were around in, in the area. Not all the things, as you will see, because I, I want to present the main open problem that remains uh, in this subject that you will see very soon, which I think is, is very cute, and I hope some people in the audience maybe can solve this problem now. 
in this century. So you have the definition, I hope that you, you read it, uh, for Sidon, just a, a, a Fourier series with spectrum in the set of frequencies lambda. If, if you have a continuous function with this Fourier transform supported by the set, automatically it's absolutely convergent, okay? So that's very special, obviously. That's Sidon. Randomly Sidon is the same thing, but you don't assume the function is continuous, you just assume it's continuous for almost all choices of signs that you stick in the Fourier uh, series. And I'm talking formal Fourier series. We don't worry about convergence, okay? Formal Fourier series. And then a, a, a property that looks uh, rather different is sub-Gaussian. So sub-Gaussian, now you assume the coefficients are in L2, always uh, supported by the set, and this implies that your Fourier series behave, has a Gaussian tail, behaves like a, a, a Gaussian random variable, okay? You have this uh, exponential x squared integrability. So these are the, the three main properties that I want to discuss today. I'll start by the talk by, by reminding you what's the classical theory, and then something very nice happened, which is that actually the, while the field was dormant, then last year Jean himself with Marc Lefko actually revived it and, and proved some results on orthonormal systems, which I, I'll get to a little bit later, which got me actually back into the, this direction, which I, I, I didn't think I would also come back to that, but that, that'll be a little later. So you have these three properties, okay. Well, the point is, they're all equivalent. They're all the same. So, <coughs> Sidon implies randomly Sidon. This is obvious. Sidon implies this sub-Gaussian property that was noticed, that was proved in a famous paper of Rudin on trigonometric series with gaps. 1961. Then Ryder in 75 proved that the randomly Sidon and Sidon actually they are the same, okay, although the one looks apparently weaker than the other, they're actually the same. And then in 76 I managed to, to, enhance, to answer Rudin's question, Rudin had read the question of the converse to his theorem, and I proved that Sidon is the same as sub-Gaussian. So I remind you, you know, I remind you what is sub-Gaussians. The point, the point of the difficulty here is that the inequalities, you know, don't seem to have much to do with each other because you, you here your, your L2 behavior implies a Gaussian behavior and up there you're in L infinity and little L1, okay? So it's, it's not quite clear why, if you haven't seen this subject, it's not quite clear why this would be true, but turns out that uh, this is true. Now, I, I think I'll stick mostly to the torus and so the integers and sets of integers, but actually you can take any compact abelian group and do abstract harmonic analysis, the set of continuous characters, and everything, all the definitions, you know, are the same and the results, all the results I'm mentioning hold in this more general setting. But I choose to, to stay within, within uh, integers. Uh, the, the result of Ryder that randomly Sidon is equivalent to Sidon uh, was a refinement of a famous result of Sam Drury that just said something very simple. The union of two Sidon sets is a Sidon set. Is a Sidon set. The union, it's stable by union. And this was, this was really uh, uh, quite, quite an achievement because many people had worked on it. In connection, you know, there was a theory of uh, Helson sets and so on. And you see, if you want to show that the, the union, that the union of uh, two sets that have that property also have that property, uh, you have a difficulty because how do you project? How do you project your Fourier series that has spectrum into the union of your two sets into you know, uh, each of the sets. You don't have for free a projection, okay? And so something had to be invented. It actually, it's, it's one of the most beautiful tricks in the theory that Drury invented. And, and Ryder, uh, with this randomly Sidon result, actually used Drury's idea, just, uh, you know, kind of uh, twisted, uh, uh, improved, uh, but it's related. That's why, that's why I wanted to mention Drury at this point. 
So examples, well, one example that appeared in another talk, <coughs> very classical, the Adamar lacunary sequences, if you like, the simplest, the sequence two to the n, that's an example of a, a, a Sidon set, okay? So that would be, you know, the most classical, most classical example. But actually, uh, it is, in many ways, it is special. This has, this has more property than a generic Sidon set. It can, it can be shown, for instance, with respect to Taylor series, this respect, this behaves better in H1 and things like that. So, so it's not such a good example. The really, the really good example, which maybe is, as you will see, maybe is everything in some sense, in some sense, <coughs> is what I call quasi-independent sets. So, and this is actually very much related to Sidon. Sidon sets, there's an ambiguity in the notion of Sidon sets. Maybe you've heard of Sidon sets in you know, uh, just when in, in the theory of some sets, okay? And here, <coughs> this is related to that, so that, that connects to the name of Sidon. So, a set is quasi-independent, quasi, quasi-dependent set of integers. If all the finite sums extracted from the set are different, okay? So, so it's a, it's a weaker form of linear independence, obviously, but it has something to do with, with independence. So all these sums are <coughs> distinct integers. So of course that means that, uh, well, we don't have zero in there, but yeah, so we, we, you know, we take sets that we, we put zero on the side, so it doesn't have zero, for instance, but uh, that's all right. So that's quasi-independent. <coughs> and it's a theorem that's not difficult in, in this theory that quasi-independent implies Sidon. So that's a good example of, of Sidon set, quasi-independent sets. So using this notion, actually, I could prove an arithmetic characterization of Sidon set, which is uh, just uh, what is written up here. It turns out that a set is Sidon if and only if uh, there is a, a, a fixed proportion delta such that whenever you take a, a finite subset of your set lambda, there's a proportional subset, there's a subset with a, a, a proportion uh, at least delta inside your subset, which is quasi-independent, okay? So you have to, well, it takes a while to, to absorb it, so you're, you're, you're not saying the set is quasi-independent, you're just saying whenever you, you pick uh, uh, n elements in your set, there will be extracted in these n elements, there will be delta n of them, but you don't know where, that are quasi-independent. And this characterizes Sidon sets. So the, here the difficulty is the if part. That is what is difficult in this uh, theorem, or say it's more difficult, is, is the direction where when you know that you, you have these proportional sets that are quasi-independent, then actually the whole set, you, you have information on the whole set, the whole set is Sidon. And in fact, the, 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 the difficulty here is even, you know, that this implies that if you, if you, if you look at your set of frequencies and you just know that, you don't know that it's Sidon, but you know that every time you have a finite set, there's a proportional subset, which is Sidon with a fixed constant. I didn't define the Sidon constant, but it's quite obvious what it is. <coughs> so if, if any set, finite subset, you can extract proportional Sidon subset, then your original set is Sidon. It's a consequence of that because uh, you know, you, 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 you can sort of combine it with what's written here, and this is like a corollary of that. So Jean actually, uh, in, in the first things that he did when he got interested in Sidon set is he, he gave different proofs of everything I did and got a completely different approach. Uh, I was using random Fourier series, that was my pet tool, random Fourier series, and uh, so-called metric entropy results of Dudley and Fernick uh, in the theory of Gaussian processes, which was sort of my, my, main, uh, my main tool to prove all these results. So he gave uh, direct, uh, you know, bare hands proof like he likes to do. And in addition, he managed to do uh, what I always thought might lead to, uh, to more, but apparently this uh, didn't do it. He proved more, which is, uh, the set is Sidon, if and only if actually for any probability on the set lambda, 
you can find a subset with probability greater than this fixed delta, which is uh, quasi-independent. So obviously this is uh, related because you're, you're supposed to obviously notice that if you just take the uniform probability on the set A, right, if you take uniform probability on the set A, this is just saying that the same thing as that when Q is the uniform probability on A. So that's how the sets are, that's how the, the statements are related. But it's a, it's a statement that's a bit different because in fact here the most delicate part is the only if part. So, so the difficulty here is actually to show that if the set is Sidon, actually you have this, uh, this stronger result because using the Rider result then, then somehow you, you get back to Sidon from if you have this stronger form. Okay, so that brings me to the main open problem. <coughs> Excuse me. And the main open problem is, it, 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 that would sort of, you know, really clarify the situation. Is it true that every Sidon set is simply a finite union of quasi-independent sets? If this is true, then everything is explained, all this thing with the proportional extraction of subsets, everything is clear. It's the, the structure of these sets become, become completely illuminated. But this, uh, this is still open. This has resisted uh, even Jean Bourguin. <laughs> so what is nice is that the, the previous result uh, that I stated really reduce this problem, which is a problem you could say, you know, coming from the theory of thin sets and Fourier series to something purely combinatorial about sets of integers. Because uh, your, your problem is now, suppose you have a set of integers and you know that any finite set contains a proportional subset which is quasi-independent in, in the sense that I define, which is very much algebraic. Does it follow that you can break it as a finite union of sets which are quasi-independent? That's, <coughs> right? That, that's what the problem uh, means. And so here I'm, I'm very happy that I, I, I did something. I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I saw that, well, I was reducing this to a purely combinatorial problem, so I needed to talk to combinatorists. It turned out that this happened <coughs> a little bit uh, before 1983, before the Warsaw Congress, and I had got the reprints of uh, my paper, very short, I published it as an announcement in the Bulletin AMS, very short, this characterization, and I happened to meet Paul Erdos, uh, in front of the Palace of Culture in Warsaw in 1983. And uh, although I was a bit intimidated, I went to him and said, Professor Bush, I have <coughs> something that might interest you there. And you know, I showed him the reprint and maybe you, maybe you can do something about this problem. I don't think we exchanged more than, you know, 10 words. He was very nice, but I don't think we exchanged many words. But the surprise is that after this happened, even though I thought, well, you know, I tried, nothing's happening, my friends reported that Paul Erdos was traveling the world and popularizing this problem everywhere, that actually he had <laughs> changed the problem to a problem on graph theory, finite graphs, and the same, what hit him is that what he likes is that you could ask the same problem for lots of other structures, for, you know, graphs and hypergraphs and just sets of sets. So you can ask what are the sets of sets that have the property that whenever you can get in your class of sets, you know, always inside a finite set, a proportional one in your class, then you can break your set into a finite union of sets in the class. So he, 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 really, he really jumped on it. And, uh, and then they, they, he worked with Nesetril and Rudel and they, they published uh, a few papers, you can guess why I like to quote these papers every time I have an occasion. <laughs> but the problem is still open, it, uh, it resisted. So what is known? There, there is a, a known case which is, it's very strange because the known case actually, as you see the reference is earlier, the reference is 1967 and this is a result by <coughs> Maliavin and Maliavin, so you can uh, for those who don't know, this is Mr. Maliavin and Mrs. Maliavin. They are married, so you can imagine that, you know, they're over breakfast and they are going over this 
problem or whatever <laughs> we were discussing. Mrs. Maliavin was an algebraist, and so it's very easy to guess somehow uh, her contribution because the result of Horn is, is a result purely on vector spaces. And they managed to, to, to sh prove, in particular, the, the, the conjecture, solve the, the, this, this problem before the problem actually was formulated. But anyway, prove the theorem that implies a solution. When, <coughs> uh, when the group is this group, <coughs> and then the, the dual group, the set of characters, is, is a vector space, has a natural vector space structure over the field ZP with P elements, when P is a prime number. And the amazing thing is that there is a theorem that's you know, not so well known, that's a super beautiful theorem due to, to Horn from 1954 that says just this. Suppose you have a finite set in a vector space and you know that whenever you take a, a finite subset, there is a proportion inside which is linearly independent, okay? Just linearly independent then the set is a finite union of linearly independent sets with the number of, of sets in the union strictly depending only on the proportion. So just exactly what is needed for linear independence instead of quasi-independent. Okay, so Jean uh, managed to, to extend it to products of, of primes like that, of distinct primes, and I think even if, if you introduce powers of... Uh, of distinct uh, prime numbers, is, it's not quite clear what, what happened. It's, it's really uh, it, it, something weird going on. <laughs> and, uh, but this, of course, this, this at the same time, this uh, vector space argument, which works, it, it works too well. It's a little too strong. You, when you start playing with it, you, you understand it's too strong because you have to prove the theorem for quasi-independence and here, you're independent with coefficient in the whole field of p elements, not just with, you know, zero, one coefficient or zero, one minus one coefficient. Okay. So, <coughs> recently, the, the field that was dormant uh, was given a, a new boost by, by work by, by Jean and Marc Lefko. So, presumably, this is uh, Marc Lefko came to Jean with, uh, with a few questions and that how things got working. I, I know that Mark Lefko is interested in general in uniformly bounded orthonormal systems and trying to generalize all sorts of harmonic analysis to, to this more general framework. So they wondered what remains valid if you, you forget group structure, you just take, you know, uh, in, within measure theory, orthonormal systems, obviously the characters uh, on the compact group for, from compact abelian group form an orthonormal system. This is Fourier and so on, but just take abstract system, what will remain? So, uh, I have first the, the definitions. I didn't precisely define Sidon and so on, so we can just go over now more precisely what it means for, for systems. <coughs> so, uh, a, a, a system phi n in L infinity, you could take them continuous, but let's take more generally L infinity is Sidon if you have uh, this inequality holding for arbitrary coefficients, scalar coefficients, ak, okay? So <coughs> it's, it's the same thing as the previous definition in, in, in Fourier, really. Uh, it's the inequality that corresponds to the qualitative property that I stated. And now, <coughs> randomly Sidon with constant c means the same thing, but instead of having just the, the L infinity norm here of the series, you have the average over the choices of signs of, okay, the, this series. So the randomized series, you look at the average L infinity norm of the randomized series, and you say, okay, this dominates this. And then there is a, a notion that <coughs> they, they introduced, Bourguin and Lefko, which is uh, now specific to, to these systems, which is that phi n is Tensor K Sidon, actually they use something else, but I don't like that. They, they say K fold tensor Sidon, which sounds too, too long. So let's say tensor K Sidon with constant C if the following happens. If, if your system is just Sidon, but not the system itself, the system like that. Uh, so somehow it's the system, tensor product with itself, K times, okay? 
tensor product, perhaps you don't like tensor product. I, I, here it just means that phi and T1, et cetera, phi and TK, and now your T1, TK are independent, so that you, in other words, you work on the product of your measure spaces TM, and TM, by the way, is a probability space, okay? And then sub-Gaussian, so we still have sub-Gaussian. <coughs> so sub-Gaussian with constant C, uh, means that uh, we have an inequality in this direction. Now, the, uh, this norm, I will say in a second what it is, this norm, which is the sub-Gaussian norm of this expression, is dominated by the L2 norm. Okay, so sub-Gaussian, uh, <coughs> this can be treated in several ways, but uh, one traditional way is to introduce at this point all each spaces. So we, we can just for short denote by psi 2 of x the function exponential x squared minus 1 because some other of these exponential functions actually play a role in the theory. So let's say psi 2 is this one. I'm conforming to tradition, traditional notation. And, uh, <coughs> oops, we say that uh, phi n is sub-Gaussian with constant c if the, the norm in the Orlich space associated to this function is uh, dominated by the L2 norm. And if you don't know what's an Orlich space, I didn't want to, or maybe I, maybe I forgot, no, I, I think I, I just didn't want to spell out the definition of an Orlich space, which, you know, it's basically something like LP, but instead of the function x to the p, you have this function, and so it's not homogeneous, so you'd have to make it homogeneous. <coughs> it's, it's a classical thing. And anyway, I didn't define this Orlich norm because for sub-Gaussian, uh, there's a better way uh, that it can be written, which is written here. So the sequence is sub-Gaussian and it ex explains very well the, the term if you have, for some constant c, this inequality. I, I just need uh, to, to have them mean zero, so, but which is, it's obvious you can just just, uh, you know, subtract the, the mean and, and reduce to mean zero systems, so that's no, no, no problem, no issue. And of course, uh, what you see in, the, in this definition now with sub-Gaussian, which is nice, is that the equality case in this inequality, the equality case corresponds to Gaussian, obviously, right? So this is equal if and only if the, the distribution of the system phi k is actually <coughs> independent Gaussian random variables, and then this c squared has something to do with, with the variance. This is very classical. So we have the, the, the Gaussian now as an example, naturally as an example of, of sub-Gaussian. So <coughs> uh, going back to what Bourguin and Lefko did, so first we can get rid of one direction. So Sidon implies sub-Gaussian, this really doesn't work. This really doesn't work because, you see, uh, the inequalities that the property described go in a different direction. So, uh, let's see, do I have it in the previous one? Here. So, if I, if I have a, a set which is Sidon, it's now abstract, there's no, no constraint. So, I can take my measure space and on, I can put a Sidon set on half the space and then my probability space, I have another half, and I put anything, absolutely anything, on the other half of the space because there's no, no restriction. So it's the, the, the L-infinity norm will still be bigger than what happens on the good part of the space, so it will be Sidon. And obviously, since here the inequality is in the other direction, I can kill because I can put something bad enough on the, the other part that will kill the, the, so, so definitely that doesn't work. But uh, uh, they, uh, they proved by a, a more sophisticated example that sub-Gaussian <coughs> also does not imply Sidon. So, so then you, you might wonder, but then <laughs> what am I going to talk about? I mean, you know. <laughs> okay, but you see there are things still hidden. So, so however, they, they managed to prove the following result which is that, uh, okay, sub-Gaussian does not imply Sidon, but sub-Gaussian implies this tensor 5 Sidon. So tensor 5 Sidon now, just to be sure, I, I've made explicit here, it means this inequality here. 
And what's, what's really nice about this result is that it includes my, my, my previous result in the case of characters, because of course, if you're, if you're dealing with characters, they are multiplicative. So your, your tensor five, tensor five or tensor one is the same because look, phi k t1, phi k t5 is phi k of t1, t5. And if you take the soup, that means, you know, that means that that's sidon, right? So that contains the, the case of character. That's really what's nice in this uh, viewpoint. But then there was something for me that they, they asked the question whether five could be replaced by two. And uh, I was delighted that I, I could do that. So, so that's, uh, that's actually true. In fact, I uh, could improve this to uh, tensor two sidon, which of course is optimal because they checked that it does not imply sidon. So we have, uh, we have the theorem like this now. And in fact, uh, the result is actually, and I think that maybe this is, this, there is some interest there. It's really uh, extremely, it, it, it's very general. And, and the proofs are, are really quite simple, are really, the, the, anyway, the ideas are very simple. But it's a little bit maybe hard to read um, for you. So the generalization here is, is is twofold. First, instead of uh, having just uh, the tensor product of the same things, I allow two different things, okay? So I have psi n1 tensor product psi n2, so that's one generalization, and I've incorporated in the statement that I do another generalization, and this one I think is, is a good idea, which is that I don't say that the system psi n1 itself is biorthogonal to itself, but I say it's biorthogonal to another one, phi n1. So this phi n1, phi n2, these are going to be systems which are, they're not necessarily bounded, they're in L1, but these we assume they are sub-Gaussian. Okay, so let me, let, me, uh, let me comment more, just make sure you, you, the point comes across. So now I'm saying, okay, I take systems psi n1, psi n2, which are biorthogonal to sub-Gaussian systems, all constants fixed, and which are bounded. So did, did, did I, maybe I, I forgot, there's C prime, ah yeah, they are, they are the, the, the psi are uniformly bounded, they are bounded in L infinity norm by C prime one, C prime two. And the, the other ones, the phi n, are bounded C one, C two in sub-Gaussian property, okay? So then the conclusion is, uh, is, is this one. So the, the, the reason I, I, I really uh, like this formulation is that now this makes sense if we uh, apply it to Gaussian. So you see this, this becomes the, the, the basic example. You can think of this one as the, the starting point and then this says that it's much more general really, but if phi n1, phi n2 are just gn, which I use for a notation of IID standard Gaussian normal random variables, okay, then I can take the signs of these IID Gaussian. It's well known that it's uniformly distributed over the signs, whether you choose real or complex, you'll have real signs or complex signs, unimodular, you know, you, 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 whatever you prefer. But in any case, uh, the, 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 this fits, this is an example inside uh, this theorem to which this theorem applies. And in some sense, it's the, it's the well, it's not exactly the, the, the prototypical example, but related to it. The key new ingredient is a, is a corollary of a, a powerful result due to Michel Talagrand uh, that, uh, <laughs> combined with a, a softer hand banach argument says uh, the following. It's, uh, it's not exactly a characterization of sub-Gaussian, but you could sort of massage it and transform it into a characterization. But as it is written, it's not. There's no converse. If phi n is C sub-Gaussian, then there is a bounded linear operator from L1 to L1 with norm bounded essentially by, by C up to some numerical factor. And that takes your Gaussian, the, the standard Gaussian, to phi n. Okay, so 
it's, it's satisfactory because, we, well, sub-Gaussian is dominated by Gaussian, and here we are saying, yes, that this implies dominated by Gaussian in this, you know, uh, linearized way, but in a, in a stronger way than just the definition of <coughs> sub-Gaussian. Uh, one small comment here is that uh, Talagrand's paper uh, solved uh, the majorizing measure problem <laughs> and characterized, gave a characterization of bounded, uh, of Gaussian processes with bounded, sam almost surely bounded sample path. That was, uh, uh, that's a possible description of his main result. But actually th there's affiliation with the other results that I mentioned because uh, the results that I was using for random Fourier series used, you know, characterization of stationary Gaussian processes with almost surely bounded sample path and Talagrand's result, you know, was clearly proved based on the inspiration of the, the theory for stationary Gaussian processes, which is classically um, due to Fernick and Dudley, Dudley and Fernick and a number of other people should be mentioned. <coughs> but uh, he proved uh, his result on the Gaussian process with no group acting, with no structure. So it's not surprising that this is the result that here helps us. Now, uh, what really clarifies the, the picture for, for the, the proof of the theorem is to use tensor products. So I, I know some people don't like tensor products. I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, don't be afraid because I'm only going to use the projective and injective tensor product norm on L1, tensor L1, and this is extremely simple. So if I have a, a, a finite rank tensor, so this is a finite sum, and I look at the projective norm, it's just the L1 norm over the, it's the L1 norm over the product of the measures M1 times M2. Okay, so that's L1 over the product. <coughs> For the injective norm, it is uh, this, so it is uh, the norm of this tensor viewed as a bilinear form on L infinity times L infinity. So it is also not a big deal, right? So in other words, if you like, this, this tensor defines an operator from L infinity to L1 of finite rank. The norm of this operator is what I denote in this way. And that's the traditional notation of tensor products going back to Grothendieck, of course, before he did algebraic geometry. So the, the key uh, result for the, the theorem I, I've already stated is, is the generalization is this one. And uh, it, uh, <coughs> it says that whenever you have two systems that are sub-Gaussian, so these are going to be the, the systems as before, biorthogonal to the, the Sidon systems, okay? You have two systems that are sub-Gaussian, then this uh, tensor in L1 tensor L1 admits a decomposition like that for any delta, so delta is going to be arbitrarily small, uh, a decomposition with uh, the projective norm less than W delta, and so the tensor is not controlled in L1, it's, it's quite clear it cannot, but it's approximately controlled in L1, it, ju just the error is, is done in this uh, injective norm. So delta is small, so R is like a perturbation of, of this T, but Perturbation must be there. It's clear, it's, it's absurd to, to, to think of this with delta equals zero. This, this no way. So that's, uh, that's the, the, the key, key fact. And what is very amusing is that, you know, while this, you, you would think, well, this looks rather sophisticated and so on, but, but in fact, at, at, at this stage, ev everything really fell into place wonderfully because since you have this Talagrand result now that tells you that sub-Gaussian is the image of the standard Gaussian, okay, and you have tensor norms. Now, all this is formulated with tensor norm. There is a point to do that because if you have a bounded linear operator from L1 to L1, this operator will respect tensor products because this is indeed a Banach space tensor product. It's the largest and smallest tensor products norms. This is, you know, Grothendieck's uh, philosophy is how he told us taught us. And, uh, and so, in fact, this statement reduces to the Gaussian case. And then, if you look at what it means in the Gaussian case, well, you, you need maybe to, to, to have some sort of experience with <coughs> Gaussian kernels. There is something 
very well known now called the Meller kernel, which is the kernel of the, the famous the ornstein ullenbeck semigroup, the semigroup which is hypercontractive and so on, which has been you know, studied all over the place. You look at this uh, kernel uh, for delta between zero and one, and you have to do some pretty obvious adjustment if you try to, to do it, and this, this comes out. The, the estimate with the log is something that had appeared in uh, this Sidonset theory before, so it was recognized in, in Sidonset, also in Banach space, that, that this, this log, in, in, whenever you have a certain pattern, this log comes up. And so I, I could uh, recognize that easily. It's, I, I think the, the estimate might actually be of use. So I can now show you the proof. Uh, and the, we have this instruction, we should always prove something. It's wonderful because I'm, I'm really giving a, a simple talk and I can, uh, of course, admitting what was before, I can show you now the proof. So proof of the theorem that was labeled one. So we, I remind you, we want to show that from, uh, from um, we want to show that this, uh, what was theorem one? Let me, let me go. Okay, that's theorem one. Okay, so <coughs> we have this system CN1, CN2, which are biorthogonal to sub-Gaussian system. And we want to show that this, this uh, system dominates little l1. <coughs> so we want to show, in other words, that uh, the, the, the conclusion here, we want to show that f, you, you read f on top, f infinity has to be greater up to a constant than this. This is the objective. And then, uh, so we, we want to have the modulus of an appearing, so this is minor, we just introduce the sign of an, or the, the unimodular part of an, okay, so modulus an is sn an, sn of modulus one, and it's completely obvious, trivial, that sub-Gaussian passes if I multiply by choices of signs, it's, it's a unimodular, unimodularly invariant in some sense, so I can consider this tensor and it will also have the same uh, thing because this, this is my new sub-Gaussian system. I, I apply the previous theorem, I decompose T plus R and then <coughs> I take F against S, okay? And F against S, this is where I use that phi N1 is biorthogonal to psi N1, phi N2 biorthogonal to psi N2, okay? So if I, this is biorthogonal, so I'm going to get sum of S N A N, so I get sum of modulus A N, right? Right? Okay, and now, of course, the decomposition is, is the key, so now this is, oops, G. So now uh, it is this f uh, times s is actually f times t plus r. Now I, I have t and r to exploit. So t, uh, t is bounded in L1 norm over the product by W delta. So f t will be bounded by the L infinity norm of f times W delta. And now f r, I, 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 I develop f, f was here, so I develop f as a sum, modulus a n times psi n1, psi n2 times r. But psi n1, psi n2, this is where it's used, are uniformly bounded in L infinity. So now for each n, for each n, <laughs> for each n, I have the, the, same, uh, the same bound of uh, delta c prime 1, c prime 2. This is the bound in L infinity times sum of modulus a n. And finally, the the trick, which is uh, all over the, the place of this theory, is we call it extrapolation trick, is that it looks absurd because it looks like we are majorizing by what we want to majorize, but delta is arbitrarily small. So we can now, in the end, choose delta so that delta C prime one, C prime two is one half. And then we have sum of modulus of an on the left also. So good, we subtract and so, so of course, implicitly in the last line, I've made the choice of delta so that uh, here this is, you know, positive. So that's how it goes. So about randomly Sidon, uh, uh, Bourguin and Lefko noticed that uh, actually this theory of Gaussian processes that was important in what I was doing, you know, long ago, also comes up here. And there is a, a comparison theorem of Slepian that tells you that 
randomly tensor K C don is the same as randomly C don. So if, if, as, as soon as you take your, your random signs in front, you can tensorize, it makes no difference. Um, this is because you can introduce, change this, replace the signs by Gaussians and <coughs> use properties of, of Gaussians. But uh, the thing which is not clear is how to compare randomly Sidon and Sidon. That is now we are addressing a, a, a generalization of Ryder's theorem that for characters, randomly Sidon and Sidon are the same, okay? And so I could prove the, this, there's not quite optimal. I could prove that uh, a system is randomly Sidon. That's, now this is for system which are both bounded in L infinity, I, I, I need that. Uh, it's something a bit more general, but I, I, I try to simplify the statement. So, by orthogonal and both bounded in L infinity, the system Psi n is randomly C don. So, Phi n doesn't, you see, doesn't appear, but it's part of the assumption that I have Phi n bounded in L infinity that admits a by orthogonal system bounded in L infinity also. So, that's a property of Psi n that there exists Phi n. <coughs> so then, randomly Sidon is equivalent to tensor 4 Sidon, to tensor k Sidon for some k more than 4 or for all k uh, more than 4. So the, the, that obviously, just like before, that now generalizes Ryder's result because, again, if you have characters, then the tensors don't matter and so you have the equivalence of Ryder between randomly Sidon and Sidon. Just, just here, I, I couldn't do uh, <laughs> the sharp thing. I don't know if k equals two, k equals three uh, work. The, the trick really goes up to, to four. Now, there's uh, something that's really dear to my heart uh, on which uh, Bourguin and Lefko did not work and actually on which Bourguin also did not work. I think he really didn't like that and probably he had good taste because this was really sort of uh, not popular at the time, but I've always liked this. Uh, this is uh, the case of Sidon sets on uh, the dual object of compact non-abelian groups now. So, so now the, the situation is this. You have a definition of Sidon is what is written here. You have a, a, a set now of irreducible representations on your compact group G, and uh, it's formally the same you have here your Fourier series. This is now Fourier in the sense of Peter Weil uh, Fourier series. You have your Fourier series that's in L infinity <coughs> and it dominates the, the, the norm which is now the, the analog of the little l1 norm but you have to, well, there, there are conventions with the dimensions of the representation. Now the dimensions are not one anymore, they are arbitrary. And the, the trace class norm appears, so here the coefficient is as it is in Fourier series, right? It's a matrix coefficient. Your Fourier transform is matrix valued and it is the, the trace class norm of this coefficient, Fourier coefficient A pi of this Fourier series when pi is in lambda. Then randomly C don is, is the same, just you, you, you randomize using not choices of signs but independent uh, random matrices uniformly distributed over the orthogonal group, okay? And in fact, it's known that uh, th this was studied earlier, Ryder, collaborators, Figat, Talamanca knew already that you could replace by all sorts of groups uh, behaving similarly. So unitary is equivalent to orthogonal, is equivalent to SOD, SUD, Ma makes no difference for, for this convergence of these random this random Fourier series. Uh, but one step which is important is that one can also go to Gaussian. So this is something which I had very early on uh, studied. In fact, uh, I have a book, a Princeton University Press book with Michael Marcus uh, published in 1981, which is about Gaussian random Fourier series where we also include the case of uh, compact groups. So um, in this case, you have to uh, replace the random uh, unitary or random orthogonal matrix by a, a Gaussian random matrix. We don't need to make it self-adjoint, it would be the same anyway. So just such that the, uh, this 
family, I think I, I, I forgot the IJ. So the IJ entries of the matrix G pi normalized properly, so here we, I multiply by dimension to the one half, are an IID Gaussian family. This is the, the, this is the standard choice. With this choice, it's known that the norm of this matrix on the average and in the limit, in a very strong sense, is equivalent to two, right? This, this is something that now, of course, is, is very well known because the theory of random matrices has invaded uh, almost uh, everywhere in, in mathematics, but wasn't the case 40 years ago. Uh, so Ryder extended all the results to arbitrary compact groups. Uh, however, he did something really uh, which at the time, uh, you know, I, I didn't pay much attention because, well, that was, you know, his choice. He did not publish the details of the non-commutative uh, equivalence, non-commutative case of the equivalence randomly Sidon and Sidon. And I did not know why I was, I needed his result to, to sort of continue. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this in the past because this is like, you know, almost 40 years ago, 35 years maybe. I wrote to him and he very kindly sent me the details of, uh, of, of the proof and I, I think I convinced myself that it's completely correct. I assumed he would publish them. He didn't, never publish them. I lost his letter. <laughs> and a few months ago, I was horrified when I uh, realized that actually I didn't know how, how this was proved. The union, you know, the union problem in the non-commutative case was not clear to me. But uh, I'm happy to report that I managed, after some effort, to, to actually reconstruct what I think was his proof. This involves rather delicate calculation of uh, um, involving Weil's character formula on the unitary group. You have to do some estimates on the, you know, these determinants, these ratios of determinants that appear in uh, Weil's formula. But I, I'll put this in, in archive in, uh, in about a couple of weeks. So what is the generalization? So the generalization now, uh, again, where we want to pass now to function systems and forget groups. So this is going to work exactly the same. So, uh, you know, I, I need to define the analog of Gaussian. I've already done it. So well, now I've put the IJ. So this is my matrix GN, DN times DN matrix, right? Will be a random Gaussian matrix with this normalization. So in L2, we have that. <coughs> so that will be our, our standard Gaussian uh, system. And then we, we consider now phi n will be a random variable, which will be a random matrix of size, oops, size dn times uh, dn on this uh, now general probability space. Okay, so the sub-Gaussian condition uh, is, is just... Uh, simply this, and in fact, it just means that uh, now uh, this, this system now is sub-Gaussian in the previous sense, so the entries of these matrices are, are sub-Gaussian in the previous sense. The uniform boundedness has to be uh, stated, otherwise it's not interesting, has to be stated properly, so with the operator norm of the matrix, so it's the L infinity norm of the operator norm of the matrix, it's the natural analog of the non-commutative L infinity norm, and the orthonormality, uh, which I would have liked to relax, but I, I didn't quite see, is, is, is actually rather strong. It's like that. So uh, I think I, I wanted to simplify. So here I'm, I'm stating that the, the phi ends, are, the entries are uh, up to the normalization are orthonormal. Okay, normalization was with this square root of the n, so, so it just goes like that. So, they're orthogonal with respect to n. If I have n different from n prime, it will be zero, but also all the entries are orthogonal, which is the case if you, if you think of an irreducible representation on a compact group, all the entries, this is, you know, Peter Weil, Plancherel formula, are orthonormal up to the, up to the normalization. Okay, so uh, now, uh, the definition of tensor K Sidon uh, just means that uh, this product is Sidon, but now in the sense of random matrix. So the product, the pointwise product is done as a matrix product. And so this will be Sidon now as a, 
<coughs> random matrix, and everything is the same. So sub-Gaussian implies tensor 2 Sidon, and randomly sub-Gaussian is equivalent to uh, tensor K Sidon for K, you know, at least 4. It, it's just uh, the same results. Uh, I have a, here an example of application which seems to me it might be interesting, but quite honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure that there is not a, a simple way to, to see this, but I kind of, I kind of like it. So I look at <coughs> the set of uh, matrices which have uh, a norm bounded by some fixed number chi, so chi will be, uh, yeah, chi will be, you know, like 10 or something like that. <coughs> and the matrices otherwise are such that the, the entries are of modulus 1 over square root of n. I can make plus minus 1 over square root of n, so maybe real entries. I just look at these matrices. So it's known that, you know, obviously if you take the convex hull of this set, it, it's very easy to prove that you will not get uh, all, uh, you will not get something that essentially covers matrices with norm one or bounded by something you know, related to this chi. It, it's, it's a different thing. And the, the, as a corollary of the previous theorem, one sees that, uh, however, if I take the set of products of two such uh, matrices, which resemble, you know, resemble vaguely, remotely Adama matrices, products, uh, they are, are enough to, to, to give you an equivalent of the trace class. So you get the tensor 2, that's the tensor 2 Sidon property. And so in other words, the ball of uh, Mn, n times n matrices, is, is equivalent to the absolutely convex hull of this, uh, of this set of, of products of these things. Uh, looks like a good way to illustrate maybe the, this non-commutative case. I'm not sure what I have. Uh, yeah, it's probably time to, to stop. I just want to, to finish by emphasizing uh, one thing which this example already emphasized, which is that uh, the, the, the theory of Sidon sets in the non-commutative case actually died very quickly because of a cultural phenomenon or socially cultural phenomenon <coughs> which happened in the, in the 70s and see, all the theory of thin sets had been developed for infinite sets. And the typical example was Adama, Lacunary, you know, two to the K and so on. And people just went to, into the non-abelian case very enthusiastically until uh, uh, there was a cold shower. Actually, Ryder is, is the person, again, that uh, although he went to the non-commutative case, also killed it, discovered that if you take, you know, the simplest example, SU2, SU2, where you can calculate everything about, you know, irreducible representations. There is no infinite Sidon set in the, the set of representations of SU2. So this came as a big shock to people, and they, the, the, the theory, well, people said, oh my God, you know, the, 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 the theory had a bad name suddenly. Everybody uh, left and started studying other groups, the free groups, and uh, you name it, all sorts of things. There was a lot of people from Italian school, Polish school, that sort of went around. But now that uh, the theory of random matrices has become popular, it actually makes a lot of sense to consider Sidon sets that are even singletons. So it doesn't matter that there are no infinite Sidon sets, you know, in Lie groups, because you can just consider, for instance, uh, uh, what is here, you consider a sequence of compact groups and a sequence of non-trivial irreducible representations on these compact groups. You know, there's also all the things that have been done, of course, on spectral gap expanders and so on. Now everybody is now used to this approach because of expanders, expanding families and so on. There is, you know, it's a different culture now. And uh, there is a very beautiful uh, theorem that comes out of the things I, 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 I've mentioned which concerns just singletons that are Sidon. And, and, and the theorem is the equivalence between all these properties here. And it says that if you just have one representation, so a sequence of representations, and the dimension tend to infinity on your groups Gn, <coughs> the very property which I really find very nice is that just if you know that the character of the representation is uniformly sub-Gaussian, 
over your sequence of representation, then automatically you, you know that the range of the representation is such that, that the convex hull of the range gives you the whole ball of Mn. So th this, this says that any time you have a, an irreducible representation which has a sub-Gaussian character, the range of the representations you looks very much like the so-called defining representation of UN, the defining representation that takes your <laughs> unitary matrix to itself acting on CN. Sometimes it's, the name is a problem, but the defining representation makes sense. So this is a, this is a characterization of representations that uh, asymptotically resemble the defining representations. I like to advertise this. I, I, I always thought that this result would uh, one day uh, be used, and so perhaps people in the audience will be happy to use it. Thank you very much. Thank you.